Okay, so thank you for the introduction. So this is the first talk I've given after going to the beach and on a hike in the morning, so it's quite nice uh, to be here. So I'm based in Oxford. Um, I don't know, some of you have probably visited o Oxford, so you probably see the sort of dreaming spires of Oxford. You know, you've got the fancy, the old buildings. Um, we've got very modern buildings too. Now I work in the Women's Centre, which is a moderately old building, 50 years old. It doesn't look like the old ones, and it's probably not in as good state as the old ones. Um, so today I'm going to talk a bit about the research that we've been doing um, in ME CFS. And we've been working in this area for the last two years. Um, I'm a basic scientist by training, so I work on things called mitochondria. You may, most of you probably know about those if you keep up the literature in this area. So I'm, I'm going to talk about the research, but I'm also going to give you a bit of background to the, what we need to do to get a drug in this illness. What, do we need to do to get pharmaceutical companies interested in this? And things I'll just, just briefly go through because I think it's not always clear what, what we have to do as scientists uh, in, in general. So a bit of background on me. I've been working in research for 30 years. And about three years ago, I thought, well, I want to do something that really makes a difference. What, what could I work on? And I've worked on interesting things, uh, diseases of the brain, um, diabetes, <laughs> Uh, oxidative stress in models, cells, and mice systems. And so what, what could I work on? And I got interested in ME through various routes, and I'll come on to those. Um, but I've quite a lot of um, money from pharma, so we've worked with pharmaceutical companies, and we work with charities, and I've got two grants at the moment from the ME Association in the UK, and they really got us going in this space. I've published quite a few papers, but I really wanted to do something where we could make a real difference to patients. And, and one of the things that we can do now that we couldn't do 30 years ago is the technology has developed enormously. And just to, just to give you some insights, really, when I started in the, in the laboratories, this was what we had. We had one of these in the genetics lab in Oxford. This is the first Macintosh. Um, it's pretty slow, but it was great at the time. We all looked, used to look at it um, on the desk. Um, so that was where we were 30 years ago. I'm not, it's never good to be ill at any time but I think now we have the real chances to make big differences in many diseases. So we've now gone from this. <clears throat> this is a, a, sequence, a DNA sequencing lab in China. There's just 50 of these machines, and all working flat out. This is um, in the UK, uh, in Edinburgh. That's the UK Biobank. And this is about um, 10 meters high, this room. There's a robot here that goes up and down a rail. And this, in, in these different carriages, it's at minus 180 degrees, and there's all patient samples stored in here. And people are now using these samples for various projects, and this, this was unheard of. Um, this puts it into real perspective. So this is the Human Genome Project, which you may have heard of. Um, this was started in <clears throat> 1990, it took 13 years to finish. They took one human, and they sequenced the whole genome. It was carried out in, in lots of different centers throughout the world. Um, it cost two billion pounds to do one genome. This is a recent UK project, the 100,000 Genomes Project, and it took five years. Um, they sequenced 100,000 genomes. Uh, it was all done in the UK by the NHS, um, and one genome sequence, this, takes 30 minutes to do and costs 600 pounds. So this is where we've come, and this is what we can do, and in the future, they plan to sequence a million sequences. Now, why is this important? Um, and what does it mean for people like you? Um, is that at the moment they focus on cancer and rare genetic diseases because they're easier to work out. You know, a complex thing like MECFS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, that's going to be much more complicated to work out. So they've focused, and, and at the moment, if you look on the BBC website, there's a couple of reports of a couple of cases of. of kids with a rare condition but from this DNA mutation they found, they can now treat them. Um, there's one quite remarkable case. So the next step is to look at more complex diseases. And what we need to do as researchers and the wider community is to get our understanding of this illness up there with, with the things like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And then we may get the chance to get patients with MECFS sequenced through this process. So one of the things I want to mention um, briefly, so I'm a basic scientist over here, and then we have the patients, we have clinicians, so like in Oxford, and we work with the consultants. But what's crucial in, any, in this type of research with patients are these clinician scientists. They tend to be young, 
they come in their sort of 20s, they're not fully trained, and they get allowed to spend time in the lab. And what we don't have in MECFS are these people. No one has really got interested in this field. I and mean, that needs to change if we're going to make progress, because the clinicians, they're very helpful to me, but they don't have the time to, to, to actually be at the intermediary between me and the patients. And then you have the patient advocacy groups, and there's several in the UK that are very active and very useful, the charities, and then funding bodies, which we need to get our research on and get them funded. Um, and the biggest challenge I see, we can do lots of research, but at the moment there's a huge problem in the UK and probably globally um, that not everybody's working together. There's lots of things about pace, graduate exercise, and, and all the rest of it, and it doesn't really help somebody like me coming into the field and trying to get the clinicians to work with me. And that, we need to work on that. Um, so I mentioned about a new drug. Um, how do we develop a new drug? What do we need to do to develop a new drug? So we need to know where to target the drug, so a therapeutic target. Um, and then when I worked with Pfizer, they had a whole a load of compounds that they knew should work, and we then tested those in our systems. Um, the next step costs hundreds of millions of pounds, so a drug company needs to be really sure that this target is a valid one before they're going to put money in. And then you look for, are you going to manage the condition or try and cure the patients? A good example of a drug um, it's metformin. I don't know any of you who have diabetes. It's the frontline drug for diabetes um, across the world. 439 million people are affected or proposed to be affected by 2030. It was from French lilac, so it was developed from a plant. And many drugs that we use now came from plants and it's evolved. But it doesn't cure the condition, but it treats the glucose, um, the elevated glucose in the body. And that might be where we need to go in MECFS. And just the last slider of this really is you need to establish a cause um, to be able to treat a disease. And if you look at the Alzheimer's research over the last 30 years, it hasn't got very far. And what they've tried to do is to treat the pathology. So the things in the brain that are abnormal in a patient, they've tried to get rid of those. So they're treating somebody here that's got dementia, 75 years old maybe, and it hasn't really worked very well. But if you think about the progression of the disease, it probably started a long, long time before that, and it's really hard to work out where it started, and really you want to be treating somebody before they even get Alzheimer's disease, if you're going to slow down the process. And that's, I think, the way we need to think about CFS. We need to try and work out, well, what drove that per person to get ME-CFS? And if we can work that out, then maybe we can intervene earlier in the process. So ME-CFS, you're probably aware of a lot of the symptoms post exertional malaise, fatigue, a whole battery of things that many of you probably suffer from. And in terms of the science, I came in because <clears throat> I had an interest in mitochondria. Um, there's also stuff about altered metabolism, how the body works. Um, blood f flow to the brain might be impaired. And there's lots of people interested in immune systems. But we have not really connected these together yet um, in how they work. I'm very, we're very interested in these two, and I'll mention some data that we have on those. But do these two impact on the other systems that seem to be upset? And, and we don't really know this, and this is what we need to do, is to piece all the bits together of the puzzle. Um, so I work on mitochondria. You probably can't see this very well. Um, we think they came from bacteria originally. Um, bacteria are very similar to mitochondria. They make energy in our cells. Um, they can look different. These are the green sort of elongated shapes here. This is a cell, a skin cell in growing in a dish. We stain the mitochondria green, so you can see them really nicely. And some of them go the whole length of the cell. Uh, but these, these are from um, a human liver. We were working on human liver, and they're very, very round and different. So they're different in different cells, and they can be different in different people. Um, what they do is they make energy. So our mitochondria take the food you eat, turn it into chemical energy called ATP, and that's used to work your muscles, your brain, and all those things. But mitochondria don't just do that. They are involved in lots of other things in a cell. Um, immunity is a big one that we're working out. So this is where we're looking and to try and work out what mitochondria do in terms of the processes of the cell. Um, so in my lab, we have a lot of technology, um, various things, some strange looking things. Called, one's called a seahorse system, various bits of equipment that we can measure the function of these mitochondria. 
And I'm going to just briefly introduce you to two. I'm not going to go into too much science. A bit of science. can't really talk without some science. Um, and we measure how well the mitochondria work. And we measure how the cell, the blood from the patients, is, is doing in terms of the chemicals in the blood. So I'm going to talk about MECFS, and you probably know a lot about that already, but there's some interesting things I want to raise today. Some of the work we're doing in Oxford, um, which has been over the last two years, um, some biomarker discovery, which just means we're looking for differences between the patients and the normal people. Um, are there things in the blood of an ME patient that can drive the illness, irrespective of who's got it? Could you put it in another person's blood and it would do something the same? And some new work we want to do in Oxford um, next few years. So one of the things in the last two years that I've noticed is the, the awareness of, of people. So you, a lot of you have probably seen Jennifer Bray's <clears throat> documentary, Unrest, and that's really raised the profile of MECF. And, and this is um, William Defoe, Whitney Defoe. He's the son of a famous scientist called Ron Davis, who you've probably all heard of at Stanford. And so the profile of this illness is, is much higher now than it's ever been, and this is really good for um, doing research. Um, just to give you some numbers, 15 million people are predicted to have this in the world. In the UK, it costs 3.3 billion pounds per year. And that's mainly in the care of the people. There's no drugs, so it's not a drug cost. It's the, the, the families, the parents having to look after the children, the loss of earnings of the people that have it, and, and like that. And, and between 85 and 95% of patients with ME never get diagnosed properly, because some countries it's not recognized. And even when it is, it's not easy to diagnose. Um, the human cost. So I know this family very well. This is um, the Strong family. So Nikki is the mum of Jamie who works with me. So Jamie and his sister Laura, they both have ME-CFS. But one of the things, because I don't know anybody who has this disease, you look at these people and say, well, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with them. But that is clearly not true. So Jamie um, had ME-CFS from 17. He's now almost 30. And Laura was 15. Jamie works in my lab. He, he couldn't do his undergrad um, course. He works 10 hours a week. He's probably one of the brightest people I've ever met. He does all the statistics. He's, he, he's as good as the people doing the machine learning in the Mass Institute. He's quite remarkable. And just to give them the chance was, was great. And Laura is really quite sick. Um, she managed to do a law degree lying down um, in London. So it's a real lost potential and we need to try and work out whether we can improve these people's lives. So symptoms. Um, in the US in 2015, there was more guidelines. So it's getting more easy, because other things can get into the mix, like depression can, you know, without anything else, can, can be very similar. Um, so re reduction or impairment to do normal daily functions, um, profound fatigue, post-exertional malaise, you, you do something more than you should and you suffer from that, unrefreshing sleep, um, brain fog or cognitive impairment. And this one's quite interesting, many of you are aware of this. So, this orthostatic intolerance where you know, if you lie down, you feel better, you stand up, you're, you don't, you're not able to manage your blood flow. And what, what is what's driving these things? So these are the symptoms. But again, it's not easy. Not everyone's got all of these. Um, this one's a key one, and we're trying to use this in our work at the moment. Um, yeah, so problems. It's hard to diagnose. Um, clinically, it's really hard to diagnose. Ros can diagnose. Some you probably struggle with. Um, there's no test. You can't just send your blood off and get it tested. Yes, you've got MECFS. There is no test. And most of the clinical trials, mainly the ones around the psychiatric angle, they're really based on questionnaires and fatigue scores. And they're really subjective. They're not very easy to, to validate properly. And there's huge distrust between the patient groups and the medical profession, which is not an, doesn't help. Um, but I understand why it's there. And We've had very little money in this area, research funding in the UK, it's really poor, but it is improving. Um, but is it just one illness? Um, about between 10 and 15 percent, I don't know, what do you have in, in New Zealand? Do you have GPs? Do you have GPs? Yeah, so in the 10 to 15 percent of visits to the GP are for fatigue, I, I feel tired. Um, and most of those will recover. Some don't, they fail to improve, and they get referred. In the UK, they get referred to the fatigue clinic, they get assessed and the diagnosed MECFS, the mild to moderate ones go on a, a managed program, like a pacing program. Um, some may do well, um, but do they recover fully? That's, that's a, a debate we could have later. And some fail to recover, but some of these patients can't even go on the program. They really struggle to go onto the program. So you've got this 
mixed bag of, of different things, um, all with an element of fatigue, but are these groups different? And what we do now is we tend to lump them all together and maybe we need to think about whether they should be separated out and how do we separate them out? And that's one of the things we're trying to do. So MECFS um, and controls, you know, it would be nice if they were like this. You've got the green controls and all the MECF patients are purple dots, but it's probably not like that. And what drives the condition? You know, is it a known thing that we know about? You know, these two are quite well known. This guy's not so well known. Who knows who that is? Anybody know? Um, it's for Verstappen, so you don't really know. But you know Lewis Hamilton and Vettel. People tend to know those in Formula One. Or is it something we don't really know? Um, until we start looking at everything, we really can't... Because I'm a scientist, I tend to be led by a hypothesis. So I think this could drive this condition or this experiment. And I look at that hypothesis and I test it. And that's how we do science. But we don't know enough about this illness and probably other things as well. We shouldn't really work on a hypothesis, we need to look more globally, and we can do that now, and I'll, I'll mention that. So this might, might be how CFS looks. So you have a control group, there's differences in the patients, but some of the patients look like controls, the green dots here, and some of the controls, look, you're never gonna get it black and white, it's always gonna be a bit mud muddied, and that's just the way it is, because we're people and we're different, and there's very many things that are, are different between us. Um, so this study, I don't know if you know about this, there's a rituximab study uh, in Norway. Um, this is a drug that worked quite well in a small trial. Um, about 68% of patients showed a benefit. They did a bigger trial with more patients and it didn't work. It didn't work on everybody and that because everyone's lumped together, but it worked on some people and we need to work out which ones because uh, they should be treated with rituximab and the others probably shouldn't, something else. Um, so this really shows the, the, probably the, the, the benefit of trying to subgroup the patients, but we're not there yet in terms of subgrouping. In the US, there's quite a lot of money been spent on, spent on this. I don't know what it's like in New Zealand, it's probably like the UK, it's really poorly funded. Um, but this is only recent, because uh, they're now really taking it seriously. So 10 million pound grants, the three big centers in the US, and they will make a difference. Um, this is an interesting slide, I don't know if you're aware of the epidemiology. So most people with MECFS are female, um, but there's two clear time points where people get it, either around 15 years old or at about 35. Obviously not everyone's the same, but they're the sort of average um, regions. For males, it's less common. There's a bit of a peak here at 15, and maybe something here, but it's not quite so clear cut. So are they different? Are their illnesses different from each other? Um, that's one of Ros's slides. Just thinking about the viral trigger there, could there be a viral trigger that triggers some patients with this illness? So you get glandular fever, or the Epstein-Barr virus, and most people suffer for about a month. Some, some people don't have the symptoms very bad at all. And then 9% of the people don't do very well. They have a viral fatigue, which can last six months, but they eventually will get better. And then a small fraction of the patients develop a MECFS. And this is how we think about the illness. Um, but maybe we shouldn't think of it quite like that. So this is an interesting study come out of Bristol. <clears throat> so this is from Simon Collins and Esther Crawley's group. And they looked at a, a cohort of patients in the UK that in the 1960s, they decided we're gonna take 10,000 babies and we're gonna study them for their lives. Um, so they studied all these babies and they've got samples of them over time. Well, not samples, but they've got GP records. And some of these people developed ME. And so they can go and look back and look at the data. And what was really interesting, so these are the adult group. The, the children are very similar. So you, on here you've got different clinical things. So times going consultations per patient per year, um, tests per patient per year, referrals, prescriptions. Um, and you can see this is the ME group and the control. So just looking at consultations per patient, um, this is where they were diagnosed with ME-CFS. Um, but 15 years before they were diagnosed, they were going to the doctor much more frequently. Um, and the same for other things, prescriptions per year, much more frequently. So something was happening, something was brewing before they had the full-blown disease. So maybe if people think, well, I had a virus and that triggered it, but it could have been going on. I talked to Jamie, he said, because uh, children are very similar, and he said, I didn't get many infections. So it's not everybody's gonna be the same, but it's just interesting. So maybe we need to think about, is there another trigger point? Is there a point where 
that the individual was triggered to develop ME and it took 15 years to get to the point where it really came out. And so you might think about in this scenario here, so the young, younger ones, 15, well that's about when they were born. Um, so that might be a narrow window. This is, this is not, this is me hypothesizing, this is just speculating really. And whereas the ones at 35, maybe 15 years before, that could be you know, around 20. So there may be different trigger points in the illness in these people. So, so how do we get involved in this? How do we get interested? Because it's not my area. So Norman Booth, some of you may have met, he sadly died last year. So Norman was an advocate for ME in Oxford and he really championed it. And he, and he knocked on my door for about a year saying, you know about mitochondria. Can you look at ME CFS mitochondria? And I wasn't sure. And in the end, I, I gave in and we started to look. And, and one of the reasons for that was Charles Shepard, also for the ME Association, um, supported our init initial work um, on that and gave us some funding. And then I met Jamie. So I met Jamie at the first meeting I went to where I just talked about mitochondria. And he was really fascinated with the science. And he's been working with us for two years. And having somebody in my group that's got this is really quite sobering. And you don't forget what it's like to have it. Because he, he goes to meetings with us. Um, he came to one in Bristol. And he, he put a poster on. And I said, are you sure you want to do this? Because I know how much effort that takes. And he suffered for probably two months afterwards. But he was really keen to go. So, so you do see both sides of it. So mitochondria and metabolic dysfunction. So mitochondria make energy. Metabolic dysfunction can be a whole bunch of things, and we don't really know what they all are, um, but we're looking for differences. And the first thing we were asked to look at was a test. So there's a company called Acumin in the UK. So Sarah Myhill, you may have heard of. So she advocates a test where you send your blood off to Acumin, uh, there's a guy called John McLaren, who I've met, a nice guy, um, and he does a blood test. He takes the blood and he looks at the mitochondrial function. So you don't need to know too much about this slide, but this is a score of mitochondrial function. So the ones up here are very good, the ones down here are very bad. And then you've got um, the patients down here. And the controls, the black ones, the black spots, are all pretty good. And this is a paper that they published. They published three of these papers. Um, but there was a bit of debate as to whether this was a good test because it wasn't properly validated. Um, and patients were sending samples to this group and coming back and getting a diagnosis. And they were then going to the consultant at the hospital saying, I've got this test and nobody really knew what to do with it. And, and some people saying, well, you, you try this and this and that. But there was no real evidence that tr trying these things would work. So we tried to look at the test. So what is a good test? Um, it needs to be robust. It needs to be a, I need to be able to do it and other labs need to be able to do the test. It shouldn't be affected by processing. So if the blood sits around for a bit longer, it shouldn't really make any difference. Because if you think of these two tests, one is on liver function and one is on heart. So what we use for, if, to check out somebody's liver, we look for things from the liver that come out of the liver into the blood. So you couldn't get a false result of somebody's liver failing very easily. And the same for a heart. So sometimes a heart attack, the heart is damaged, things come out. So these are quite clear-cut tests. They've been validated very well. Whereas if you have a blood sample um, and you're looking at things in the blood sample, it's a living system. So in a blood sample, there are billions of cells. Those cells are all alive and they're all doing things. And could they have an impact on the results? So we looked at this um, on normal controls. So this is, um, don't worry too much, this is just different ways of making a blood taking blood and then we measure the glucose concentration in the blood. So in our blood we should have about five or six millimolar glucose. If you're a diabetic it will be higher than that. Um, so we start off at about five millimolar glucose here and then over 24 hours you can see the blood glucose drops really really low. So you're down at one millimolar. All of the samples that get sent to this testing laboratory are at least 24 hours old. So what we're saying is that, that's okay to do that, but you need to know what's going on. And if a patient behaved differently to a control in 24 hours, then that could have an effect. So a blood in the, in the tube for that length of time could have an impact. Um, it affects glucose, but, but what does glucose do to cells? And some of the cancer work we do um, is shown it can have a big effect. So just to briefly tell you what this is, and I'll explain a bit more, this big gray cloud are all the chemicals in a cell. So in the cloud, there's 17,000 chemicals in every cell, and we can measure those. And then we can ask the question, 
if I grow my cells on this much glucose, how do the chemicals compare to a cell grown on this much glucose? And the fact that they're all in different places means that the chemicals are very different. So having a blood tube at one millimolar glucose compared to five can have a huge effect on the chemicals in the cell. And that's just a, a point we raised. And we looked at the method that Ackerman tried, and we looked at fresh blood. So we didn't want to use 24-hour samples. We looked at fresh blood. And together with Newcastle, who did the same experiments, we found that there was no difference in those blood samples. So we couldn't find a difference between MECFS neutrophils, um, which is a white blood cell, and controls when we did it this way, which is disappointing because it doesn't really support the data previously. But Newcastle have gone on and looked at the mitochondrial function um, specifically, which is different from the other tests. I won't go into details, but there was a difference. And I'm not showing the data, but you can find this online if you want to have a look. But there was a difference with this test, but not with the other tests. Um, but this is a more direct approach. Other things that we do in the lab is we look at um, cells from patients, white cells from the blood, and we work with the engineers, and they have a technique called Raman spectroscopy. You don't really need to know much about it. What we do is we shine a light on the cell, and we get some peaks. It's a bit like your barcode on your shopping. You, know, you put your shopping through in Sainsbury's, you get a barcode. So we're getting a barcode for every patient. So when we look at the barcodes on all the patients, we compare them with each other. And we published a very small paper, and we're doing more of these, where we took five patient samples and five controls. We compared the barcodes. And these barcodes are really complicated. So there's 1,500 of these peaks in, in each one. And then we asked the guys in maths who do machine learning, because they all work for the banks, and they've got these huge computers. Can you tell us which is which? So this is, a, this is the control group and the patients group. And we did quite remarkably, they could tell us from the barcodes 98% accurately which was a patient, which was a control. And for a condition that has no diagnostic test, which was quite exciting. And we're now looking at another 50, 50 patients and controls to see whether they're different. Um, the other thing we've done with Oxford Brooks, which is the other university in Oxford, is we've looked at patients on a ketogenic diet. So there's a lot of interest about whether the patients have a problem with carbohydrates. So what we noticed when we put patients on a ketogenic diet and they did an exercise challenge, they didn't really make any difference to their performance. So a patient on a ketogenic diet, they could exercise just the same as they did before. They were on a normal diet, but the controls were horrendous. They really couldn't cope. So there is something different, we think, with their ability to use glucose. And when they're on a ketones, they're, you know, they're, they work very, very well. Um, so that's something we're following up on. Um, so the message from this, really, is that there is something different with energetics, metabolism in patients. How does that fit in? You know, is it part of the disease process? Um, so is it what causes the fatigue? Or is it some compensation so they make the mitochondria work differently um, because they are fatigued? But as a, as a diagnostic test, we don't think the Ackerman test should be used as a test. But we think we need, need a test, but we need to work out what is the best way of carrying out the test. Um, so just to carry on, really, in terms of Carbohydrate metabolism, so you know, potatoes, bread, pasta, produces glucose eventually. And then you have cream and nuts, you get fats and protein. And there is other evidence from other groups that suggests that there's a problem with this. Um, and it's a problem at the level of glucose, which fits a bit with the ketogenic diet difference that we saw, and which we're following up on. So don't worry about this. Is, this is a metabolism in a cell. Essentially, you've got hundreds of these reactions going on. Um, I'm not going to test you at the end. Um, <laughs> so just to simplify a little bit, so you have A, and A gets made into B by an enzyme X, right? And then B goes to C, and that's how the process carries on. So if you look, I'm going to make you see, here is glucose. So glucose goes through the cytoplasm of the cell. Whoops. Uh, and then this red box is the mitochondria. So that glucose gets taken to the mitochondria, and this is where most of the energy is made here. So if that glucose can't get in here, you're not going to make as much energy, and you'll have to use other fuel. You'll have to use the fat, because fats can come in around the side, and proteins can come in around the side. But glucose has to go that way. So if there's a problem here, and what these people here, so it was the Fluge paper, noticed that there was a potential problem with a bridge. There's a bridge, if you like, that goes across here and carries that pyruvate or glucose into the mitochondria. 
the, we're not sure of the problem, but we think that if the glucose can't get in here, it could cause some of the effects that we're seeing. But we, we haven't proven that yet. Mm. Sorry. So, Tell me to slow down. I do if tend to talk quite far. It didn't help the patients, it but no. no, it didn't really help the patients. But we are looking at using ketones because you can buy ketones now. Ketones in the US, there's a ketone drink that's been used in Oxford to support athletes and performance, and it works very well. Um, but we need to get that into a clinical trial to test it properly. Um, so ketogenic diet, we see interesting differences. That's all I can say at the moment. But I know a lot of people that with ME, CFS, that don't eat all day. They, and also endometriosis, because I work in an obstetrics department. I gave a similar talk to this to them, and they said, well, we, we find that we don't eat. Because um, when you eat, you feel tired. And if you can't eat, and process the food differently. So they, Cara Thomas, who did the work in Newcastle, she's a patient, and she came to visit us, and she didn't eat any lunch. And I said, well, are you, are you not hungry? She carried on working all day. And I said, she said, if I eat lunch, I just conk out. So there is something in this, but we don't really understand what's going on yet. But we will find out. Um, so the other thing that's interesting that we've been looking at, are there factors in the blood of the patients that are preventing them recovering? Is there something that you're making that you make when you've got the flu or a virus that for some reason it's still there and it's still causing problems, even though you maybe you don't need it anymore? Um, so to, to look at this, we test the mitochondria. Um, so just to take you through this in a simple term, so what we do is we take cells um, from a normal muscle, from a human muscle biopsy. We grow those in a dish in the lab and we put an oxygen probe, um, so something that can measure oxygen, inside the cells and it sits in the bottom and the cells are happy but they've got a reporter that can tell me how much oxygen there, there is in those cells at that time. Then we put it in this machine that could control the oxygen in the air because the air now is 20%, it's very different from your muscles, which are about 8%. So we can regulate things to make them more like real life. Um, and then we can study this over time. So just to give you an example, so what you have are the cells with a probe. Oxygen can come in from the outside. It's at 20% if it's in here. And then the question is, do those cells use up enough oxygen to change that levels? Or are they at 20%? And from other work we've done, we were very surprised that they are different to the air. And so what you get is an equilibrium. So the amount of air coming in and what the cells use, you get a straight line. So a cell at rest will just be a straight line. When that cell gets made to work really hard, then the oxygen is used up and we get an increase in signal. So it goes up like that. Um, when we inhibit the cells, so if they're not working, it drops down. So that just gives you a, a message. And then we've tested patients with this system. So what we've done is we've taken plasma, so the blood from the patients, get rid of all the cells. We're looking at small factors. Are there small factors in the blood of a patient that can change what we're seeing? So these cells were grown at 8% oxygen. The blue line is just the cells with nothing. So the blue line, the cells drop down. So the cells are good at using oxygen. They work, they then track about 6% oxygen. When we add, um, the patient serum, sorry, the green is the, is the normal cells, the blue is with the control, so you know, I don't have any surface. If you added my serum um, to the cells, then they track with the controls. But some of the patients, there was a huge change, a huge change here. So we're changing the energetics of those cells, and they maintain that for 24 hours, which is quite surprising. Now, what we've done is we've measured this part here, where we see the big change, and then we look at the patients and compare the controls. So there's over 30 odd patients here in the red. These are the controls. They're not all the same, which you wouldn't expect them to be. And that's your spread of controls. <clears throat> Most of the patients are like the controls, but there are some that are really different. So there's maybe a subgroup of patients, and I'll come back to that. So what's interesting, going back to the question of the glucose, if I stop those cells using glucose, and we've done this with inhibitors, they do this. So this is quite interesting. We, have, we don't know for definite what it means, but I can manipulate cells to stop them using glucose and then they will use the mitochondria really fast. Um, so so the, the outcome is less energy? We don't know that. So 
the outcome, this, they're using more oxygen, so they could be making more energy. But we don't know that this is, I don't want to get into too much detail, this, this might not be any efficient. It, it may be something that doesn't. So we have to do those experiments, look at what's the amount of fuel in the cells when this happens, and we'll do that. So there is something in those patients that's changing energetic. So then there's a various things it could be. It could be a small molecule, uh, antibody, or various things it could be. So I thought you might like to hear about the microbiome. This is quite a big area in research. So over 20 in our guts, about two, two kilograms of bacteria are present. Uh, and they're hugely influential in, in our daily lives. And we've only recently discovered this. Um, and so this is just a, a cartoon, really, of, of what they do. So they're involved in uh, the immune system. And we're going into too much detail. They make fuels, which is interesting. Um, they modulate the nervous system. So these bacteria we thought just were there you know, for no particular reason have a real influence on our, on our, on our, on our function. Um, this is a paper from the Cornell group, just to give you some, some science. Again, so what they've done is they've measured the levels of a bacterial wall protein in the blood. And their sort of general thing from the paper is ME CFS patients have a leaky gut. So things leak from the gut into the patient and cause problems. So this is LPS, which is this bacterial cell wall. And you can see here, these are the controls. And some of the patients are very high. This is another thing in the blood. It's a marker. Um, again, some of the patients are very high. But you've got differences, and I think this is something I want you to take away, is that they're not all ME-CFS patients are the same. Some patients have, yeah, they've got more bacteria, but these ones don't. So they could be very different in what's going on. And the other thing that they showed in this paper <coughs> was that the amount of bacteria in an ME-CFS patient's gut was very narrow compared to the controls. We don't know what that means, but we know they were different and they were narrow in the number of bacteria that were there. The other thing we know, that there was no huge inflammatory response. So there's no mass inflammation going on in the patients. Otherwise, this thing called C-reactive protein would be really high. But there is a low level inflammation, and that could be linked to the, to the illness. So I did some work with a, a private clinic, actually, which was really quite fun. So Julian Kenyon runs a clinic called the Dove Clinic. He treats patients with ME-CFS. He treats cancer patients at end stage. He does things quite differently from medicine in the UK, if you like. Um, but what he decided to do, he wanted to test the bacteria in the bowels of patients. You know? So he took the samples, he sent them off, and then he sent them to a, a place in London, part of King's College, it's called Map My Gut. You send your stool sample, and they'll tell you how diverse it was. They'll give you a diversity score. You could do this. I think they've changed now because they're, they're trying to sell this to the world because um, it is quite big news. So you get back a diversity score. So this person here, this is normal. So if you've got a, a very diverse gut, you come out at about 13, 14. Um, whereas if it's not very diverse, you come out down here. So Julian said to me, I've done this stuff. Can you help me write the paper? Because he doesn't write papers. So we said, yeah, we'll help you write the paper. And I got together with a statistician. And we looked at the, the data. So we've got different groups. This is small numbers. You probably can't see very well. These are cancer patients. MECFS is the second one, seven of those. Then you've got irritable bowel syndrome, obesity, which is well known to have a, a, a narrow gut, um, other patients. And then we haven't got a proper controls, but we've got people that say we feel better. And there's six of those, and they were really quite diverse. But what was really interesting is all these different illnesses had this really narrow diversity score. And the question is, what does that mean? Uh, it wasn't just the ME-CFS patients, it was the cancer patients. These have probably had chemotherapy, and then you know, obesity got a lot of inflammation going on. So is this narrowness a, a cause of the illness, or is it just a consequence of being really sick? So the other thing Julian's done, which is interesting that you wouldn't get away with in, in modern medicine, so there's an idea about the restoring this biome. So if you can make it go back to normal, then can you help the patients? So you have a healthy biome with you know, good, good combinations of bacteria, um, then something happens. Maybe it's a nasty pathogen that affects the bowel, antibiotics, and that changes the state. You become more of a disease state in the bowel. And then can you then reverse that? Can you give a drug, um, like a prebiotic or a probiotic, they've all been used? Or do you transplant somebody's good bacteria into the bowel? And there's a lot of research on this going on at the moment. 
I think for C. difficile infection, which is a really nasty gastric thing, they now do this as the procedure. They transplant, they don't give you antibiotics because it doesn't work as well as this. So there's something in this. So Julian has actually done this on patients. And I've just, he just gave me this one case report. So don't go away and do this. Um, there is a big Norwegian clinical trial going on at the moment. So let's wait and see what they show. So he took this lady, um, she had ME-CFS for 20 years, history of appendicitis, ruptured appendix, and then got a nasty infection, was given antibiotics and has been sick for a long time. They gave her this treatment in July this year, and since then she's, says she's got no chronic fatigue. Now, whether this is now December, I don't know. There's, this happens a lot, I think, in, in, some, in, in this illness, where somebody tries something, it may work for a while, but is it maintained? Um, he's got a really good protocol for doing this. He gives 10 treatments as various other things. He's really thought about what he's doing, um, but it's not been clinically tried. It's a safe protocol. Um, but then, do these improvements last? And he's doing a lot of these patients, and, and he will see, you know, are they maintained over time? So, so watch this space, I think, for fecal transplantation. So just to finish off, really, um, what are we doing in Oxford, um, apart from some of the other stuff I've mentioned? Um, we're really interested in biomarker discovery. We want to identify these subgroups of patients that we should treat with different things. Maybe some have transplantation, some have other, other approaches. So we work with something called metabolomics, um, <clears throat> which you, has anyone heard of this before? Yeah? So this is our phenotype. So lots of things make this, you know, the way, this is where, the way we are. So how old we are, are you ill, are you taking drugs or, any, or even medications, the environment, you know, what you're eating, the food, your genetics will all impact on this metabolome, lifestyle, nutrition. So rather than measure someone's genetics or their age or can we look at this final output of somebody, their, you know, what makes them tick, if you like, and give us a clue of, of what factors are influencing this. So we started to do this in MECFS. And so what, we've, what we're doing, if you like, we're taking a blood sample. Um, so this is a cell, say, from muscle, um, all these pathways again. And we know these things are made by the cell, you know, different points. And we're asking the question, if we take a blood sample from a patient where the muscle bits, if you like, that come out of the muscle feed into the blood, can we get a clue as to what the muscles are doing or the brain? We can't tell what's coming from where, but is there a difference um, in what we can see in the blood? So we do it this way. It's fairly straightforward. It, it looks complicated. So you take a blood sample you process the blood sample, and you get the plasma. So this is the plasma here. So all the cells have gone. You've got a few platelets in there. Um, and then we extract those chemicals, and we run them through this thing called a mass spec. It costs half a million pounds. It's quite an expensive piece of kit. And each dot on here is potentially one chemical in the blood. And when we do this, we see some interesting things in the patients. So before I get onto that, um, we were really lucky to hook up with a guy called Pal. So Winsky from Poland. Uh, in Poland, whenever he talks, he always says, MECFS doesn't exist in Poland. It is really not recognized at all. And somehow this guy is, is doing you know, world-class research in this area, and he leaves a lot of credit for that. So he's taken 24 healthy individuals. We've got ME patients just coming into the clinic. He's also got some on graded exercise therapy, which is a bit of a dirty word. So these are pacing or uh, incremental changes over time. And we have samples of the patients before and after gradual exercise so we can see what's different. Um, he's got fantastic clinical data, so you don't just get a fatigue questionnaire. He does autonomic testing, spends about three hours on each patient. He's got a real um, workup of, of what's there. He does standard biochemistry, which you'd get uh, in the GP clinic in, in New Zealand. And we've got pre and after get exercise data. So the guys that do this, so James runs the chemistry facility for mass spec. It's not really something I do. And then we work with the students, and Jamie does the maths at the end, and he's really good at doing that. Um, the clinical variables we test are really quite unique, and nobody else really does this. He tests the metabolic rate of the patients. Um, he looks at things like their ability to use oxygen, um, their heart rate, heart rate max, and he measures their autonomic function. So this thing where when you lie down, you feel better than when you stand up. He can measure aspects of that. And you measure something called aortic stiffness. So you have your aorta, it's a big blood vessel that goes down the middle. And what he's finding in patients, it's really quite stiff. So it doesn't have that 
ability to, to flex. So when you, when you stand up, your blood has to increase, the volume has to increase, and, we, and he thinks that that stiffness is, is holding that back. So that's something he measures, and I'll show you some data on that later. So what do we get with the plasma? We pick up 37,000 metabolites on each patient, so this is a huge amount of data to, to go through. Um, we think around 11,000 of those are different, because of different tests. 5% we know what they are, and unfortunately, but we'll find out, 95% of them we don't know what they are. So these are unknowns um, that could be relevant. And so this is a comparison um, of patients to control. So what we do, we take those 11,000 compounds and we say, are there compounds in the patients that can separate the two groups? And this is looking at all 33,000. And you can see that we're starting to see separation. So the green ones are over here and the blue ones over here, the patients. So there are things in that data set that are separating that. So then what we then do is to say, if we take out the most important ones, do they then separate them out? And they clearly separate them out. So there are things in a blood sample of a patient that are different from the controls. And so this could be a diagnostic test. However, we don't know whether this is a fatigue thing or yet. Now, these are known. So unfortunately, most of the things that we find, we don't know. You can't read this, but um, the ones in pink go down, the ones in green go up. Um, some go up a bit, but the next slide really shows the, the, the dots. You can see that again. So again, these are two. Glutamine is a fuel. So glutamine is an amino acid. It can be a fuel. It's very low in patients. Now, is that because they're using it because they can't use other things? Um, so it's quite low, but not everybody. Glutamic acid, you don't normally find it in the blood. It's really high in some of the patients, really, really high. If, if it was that high in the brain, that would be a real problem because this is an, an, an antagonist. So we're looking at blood here, but we tend to want to look at brain fluid as well to see whether there could be. But again, look at these. There's these ones here. They look just like control. So again, they're not all the same. These are really interesting. These are our unknowns. Um, you don't have to be... You can probably set from the back. These are the controls. These are the, just, this is two million times. So there's real big differences in some of these unknowns that we need to work out. Are they important? And then B, what are they? Um, so just to summarize this data, we can see differences between the patients and controls. And when we look at our data for the knowns, it supports other people, which is always nice that you can do something that has already been shown. Graded exercise does not change these patterns. So there's an argument in MECFS is that, well, they're different because they don't do very much. And some of these people did eight months and they really cranked up their exercise and that doesn't change any of these metabolites. So there, there is something different about them that exercise. Um, but most are unknown and we need to find out what they are. Um, so what are we going to do next? Just the last five minutes, really. Um, and I want to talk about something called an intervention study because it's fine taking a control and a healthy or a patient um, and healthy controls, but can we make somebody change their profile? So what you're trying to do in an intervention study is to hopefully improve somebody, but that may be unlikely, but maybe can we make somebody a little bit worse, not too worse, and see what changes? Because at the moment we have 500 compounds that could be important, but which ones are the ones to go for? Um, so we do this in a small study. So we're looking to find a couple of patients, you know, 30 patients, two or three that show a clinical change or a biomarker response to something that we think could be important. And then when we do that, we do a bigger cohort and we pick out those people with those profiles to do that um, in larger studies. Um, so you have an intervention and you're trying to upset the balance, either in a good way or in a bad way to see whether we can tease out what's important. So I put this slide in because it really annoyed me. Does anybody follow rugby? Probably some of you follow rugby. <laughs> uh, so we were robbed at Twickenham in, in November with that last try that should have been a try, without a video ref. <laughs> this is the try we really scored. There's a, it's always nice to run over the All Blacks. You don't do it very often. Um, but we did this at this one time. Um, and then professional sportsmen, a lot of them go into these ice baths. So they go into a bath, um, and it helps inflammation in muscles. Um, and it's a common thing that these elite athletes do. I'm not saying we should put, I know ME CFS patients have this overload, they wouldn't want to put them in an ice bath. However, the Polish group have been doing some really exciting work um, with whole body cry stimulation and my son thought this was preservation today when he talked about this to me. But so what we're trying to do is stimulate the patients 
by going in extreme cold. And there is evidence that this can impact on the immune system. It can change inflammation. And it can change this autonomic function. And there is data, if you look in the literature, mainly from Polish studies, but in Poland it's quite a, a thing they use in the clinic for other, other conditions. So, because in Poland, as Paul says, it doesn't exist in Poland, we have to give him the money to do this. So Julian Newton and I dug into our savings and gave him enough money, Julian most of it, so Julia gave him enough money um, to run the clinical study, and I took the samples and we managed to find enough money to run them in Oxford. Um, and that's what we're going to do. Um, so the patients go into this um, system for uh, 10, 10 sessions, extreme cold. Um, they get assessed before, assessed afterwards, and then there's a follow-up. Um, so it's a minus 120 degrees centigrade. It's really cold, three minutes. But they really like it. 100% of them come back. It's not like graded exercise where only 50% come back. So it, they, they like going in. You know, when you go out in the cold sometimes and you feel refreshed, invigorated, that cold air is good. They, they really like doing it. And the data is amazing. Um, now, whether this is going to be can carried on. So this is just took two examples. This is a shoulder fatigue scale, which people don't like very much. But if you have a, a high number, it means you're not fatigued. So patients tend to have a low level. So normal is more, um, sorry, that's the wrong way around. If you have a high level, you're fatigued, and a, and a low level, um, you're normal. So this is a pac the patient group, pre-treatment, pretty high levels of fatigue. And post-treatment, they're pretty down. And one month after, they're still low. Um, we've got a 12-month follow-up coming in January, so we'll see what they look like after 12 months. It's just this one batch of 10. So you could imagine if this is something that could be done, you could do batches over time, uh, and maybe... So how many treatments does it give, sorry, 10 So 10, 10 days, um, but just one batch. Three minutes. Yeah, three minutes each time. And then they've gone off, and this is a, a month after. This is interesting. So this is, so we have lots of clinical variables, and this is the stiffness of the aorta, and it definitely goes down. Again, big error bar, so not everybody is changing, but not everybody has autonomic dysfunction, so we need to tease out the data. Um, so, where are we with what we're doing? This is a bit of a house here, there's some flowers, but really it doesn't really, and it's not easy to put it all together. Um, you know, it's not a nice cottage, which we know it is, when you know what it is. Um, so we need to try and piece things together and work out what's important. So what we're planning is a big study. So before I came away, I was frantically trying to write a grant application, and I've left it in the careful hands of my team, hopefully, in the four weeks I'm in New Zealand, I'm going to come back, it'd be like the fairies have left it on the desk. Because um, we've got to submit it on the 16th of January, which doesn't give us much time after Christmas. So it's 1.6 million pounds, which you might say, wow, that's a lot. But we worked out the other day, um, there's a guy called Ryan Sterling, pays for Man City, you might watch this video, I'll get in trouble. Um, he gets 300,000 pounds a week. So this is only five weeks of his wages. Um, so if you put that into context, it's not much really, and it's going to employ about five people over four years um, and do some good science. So just to break it down, we've already got 250 samples from the UK Biobank. So these are controls, subgroups of MECFS, so mild, moderates, and severes, 50 of each. And also what's really important are other fatigue groups. So we have a multiple sclerosis cohort, and we've just run all the metabolomics. So that last set was 24 patients. This is 250, so it's going to take us a while to sort out. So we, all, we are going to apply for money to do the data analysis on these samples. We've got a cohort from the US. What's interesting about this cohort is they have, we have blood and cerebral spinal fluid, so we can look at things like glutamate in the brain. What are the differences in the brain? And no one's really done that before. Um, we also have other, other groups with fatigue, so lymphoma patients. My mother-in-law had lymphoma, and she really suffered. The fatigue was the worst thing for her. But not everybody has that with lymphoma. Um, so we're going to look at a cohort there. Mitochondrial disease. This is the classic mitochondrial disease cohort we have in Oxford. They get very bad fatigue, and they have mitochondrial dysfunction. So are, are their metabolites in the blood different? Um, we're going to do a long-term study. Not one sample, but we take four samples over a year. We do testing at different times, because people go up and down. You, you know you go up and down. So when somebody goes up, what changes? Which of those 500 things is improving? And we, and we need to work that out. Um, interventions, I've already mentioned Powell's cryo study. We have a cohort from Sussex where they did exercise, two exercise tests. 
They also stimulated the immune system. And we're very interested in antibiotics with a group in America. This is going to be a big study set, over 1,000 patients. Um, and we want to tease out, so the main objective is, what are the key pathways? Now, we don't need to know what all these compounds are at the moment. We need to know which ones come up again and again. And then once we know that, we can then work out what they are. Because it'll take you a year to find out what these, one of these compounds is. So we need to know that. And, and can we subgroup the patients? And that's really important for various reasons. So the things in the, in the grant, we're going to do proper testing, you know, beyond fatigue questionnaires, we do this. This is the task force monitor where you get all this autonomic function. We measure metabolic rate in the whole patient. We've got brain fluid. We've also got imaging. So the Sussex study, we've got brain scans on patients with and without exercise. So we can look at that and compare to the metabolites. Um, we do very good exercise physiology in Oxford. So we're going to do a, a, a mild exercise test to see what changes. And then from my point of view, we have a whole battery of things that we can look at building on what we've done. Um, so that's why we need 1.6 million pounds. Hopefully, we'll be, so you can wish us good luck with that. Um, so defining the code, just to finish really, these biomarkers are really important. Because say this was the case, you know, the ones in light blue here, they've got an altered biome. So they should have transplantation or, anti or some other therapy. These ones have a problem with glucose. You know, maybe ketone supplements would be a good thing to do for them. Low level information, something like acupuncture might help those. Um, an autoimmune problem, there are some autoimmune diseases that look very similar to MECFS. There could be some of those lurking in there. And maybe for those, an immunotherapy would work. And there's some way you probably won't find anything at all. Um, and maybe graded exercise might be good for that cohort. So trying to separate the patients out is, is really important. So there is a difference. There really is a difference. Now, what that difference means is we need to work that through. Um, and there is a metabolic dysfunction, but is it a cause or a consequence? And that's really important to work out before we start trying to treat things that may not be that relevant. We need biomarkers for the diagnosis, and we have some evidence that we can get there and subgroup the patients. Once we know all this, we can start looking at, because a pharma, 15 million patients globally, that's a huge market for a drug company, <laughs> if they knew the, what to go for. They don't, we do the donkey work, and then they come in, well, not always. Uh, I'm going to get in trouble again for that. Um, so that's, that's where we would be. We do all this, and then we'll get some, some funding coming in from pharmaceuticals, because they have big budgets to spend in an illness like this. And to get everyone to work together, that's probably one of my top things. Because I need to get clinician scientists to work in my lab to bring me the patients. And when they become a consultant, they have an interest in this illness. They're not working on something else because they can't suddenly then become interested in MECFS. They don't have the background and training. And there's somebody called Nina Muirhead. She talked at this CMRC meeting. So she's got MECFS. She a, was a high-flying surgeon. It's worth watching her video. It's on YouTube on the Action for ME website. And she's going... Sorry? Nina Muirhead, and she gave a really sort of thought-provoking talk at the Bristol meeting about what it's like for her to have it, but she's going around the country training medical schools because they don't get told about this in medical schools. She's got a thing going with Cardiff University where she, they're actually they're going to run a pilot there to really get more training because the GPs don't always know what to do, and I think that's part of the problem. Um, so... Yeah, just to finish off, we have great collaborations um, in Oxford now with engineering, the Mass Institute, which we hope to sustain chemistry, and my group here work very hard. And then we work well with the Newcastle group and Poland have been essential and various other people here. So I know I speak fast. Hope you've got some of that. So thank you very much for listening. And I will ask the question. If you want. <laughs>
Sure. Yeah, so, so the group in Newcastle, um, so Julia Newton's group, so the person you should look up is Joe Elson. So Joe Elson has just published, trying to get a paper published, and I've heard her talk about this. So she's looked at the mitochondrial genome, so the genetics of the mitochondria, and she compared um, mitochondrial, the genome in patients in the UK and in South Africa. She has a, there are no... Um, what we would say pathological mutations. I spent 10 years working on mitochondrial diseases, so we know what a catastrophic, catastrophic change would be. But she has a program that predicted mild to moderate changes. So she ran that program on the patients, and what was really not she, surprising was that the ME patients had better mitochondria than the controls in both studies. So there isn't anything wrong with the mitochondria, uh, in terms of energy, I don't want to confuse everybody, but, <laughs> but there is, there's an interesting idea, and we're looking at this at the moment. So, um, so there's a guy in America uh, called Philip West who basically found that if you have bad mitochondria in a mouse, though not too bad, but you know, the, mouse, the mice run around, there's nothing really wrong with their energetics, those mice were really good at dealing with a virus. So having suboptimal mitochondria. So I'm wondering whether could ME patients have mitochondria that are too good in certain scenarios? Um, so antivirals, some patients take antivirals and say they work well for them, some say they have no effect. An antiviral will dampen down your mitochondrial function. So it's interesting. So there's no clear evidence that the, the energetics is compromised um, at the mitochondrial level, but there is a problem with, um, let's go back, because I, I always get nice questions with you guys. Uh, not, not nasty, but quite complicated, so. Oh yeah, sorry, forgot that bit. So, so the question was, some, some people have said that the mitochondria might be impaired and we know that the genetics of the mitochondria or some of the genetics are transferred from the mother. Yeah? So is there any evidence that there's abnormal genetics in those people? And what I'm saying is that when they tested that, there was no evidence that there's anything wrong with them. If anything, they were better. So the question is, are they, how could they be better? But the mitochondria can go wrong in many ways. So that... that Genetics in here just makes the ATP, so the energy. Um, I've got some nice slides for this, but I haven't got one in, so I can't really. I'll try. Yeah, so this ATP is linked to that DNA that you have. That, that ATP is down here, so this is your mitochondria, it makes ATP. But that ATP production is only as good as the fuel. So if you don't put any petrol in your car, you might have a fantastic engine, but it won't work very well. So there could be a problem with the mitochondria, but it doesn't have to be in the mitochondrial DNA. It could be the fuel. So if the glucose can't get in for some reason, that would cause exactly the same thing as having a problem with the genetics. So, uh, yeah. Sorry, um, over the back there. <laughs> what do I suggest? Well, I don't know enough about, you know, I've worked on this. I don't think we know enough about the illness to really recommend anything. Um, you know, people try things. Some people say antibiotic, or anti um, I know people's magnesium, things like that, but there's no evidence for any of these things. So unless we get some evidence that they work, the rituximab study, you know, it didn't work on everybody. So I can't tell you what you should do because I don't know about you. You know, I can't tell somebody over there. It might be completely different for that person over there what I would say to them. So unless I know more about what makes you have MECFS, it's a really hard thing to predict. Um, so I think just watch this space for these clinical trials. So they will be coming through. I think the microbiome is a really exciting one because I've never seen anything like that. That, that is really... But then... Was that just a one-off case? We need to do more of that. Um, Excuse me. Yeah. Um, you know, we used to read a lot about innate 
Oh, yeah. Chemi literature. Mm -hmm. I just wondered, are you aware of that product? Or? Yeah, so NAD is, again, made in the mitochondria. Um, so the chap asked about NAD. Can we boost NAD? Um, so it's a vitamin B complex. B12, I think, is NAD. Um, so you use NAD. It's involved in lots of processes. Um, it's not easy to measure. So, and also, we, we're taking a bit of a leap of faith to measure blood in a patient because the white cells in your blood, they're not active at the time we take them. You know, you're not fighting an infection um, with the blood, otherwise you'd be in a real mess. So, if we're going to measure NAD, should we be measuring it in the brain or in the muscle? Uh, it's those tissues, and that's impossible. However, there are people in Oxford that do brain imaging, and they're starting to be able to measure these compounds in the brain with imaging techniques. So they can measure things like glutathione um, and other, other things in the pathway. So, you know, I take vit so vitamin B and uh, NAD. Um, it's involved in cancer and various things like that and Parkinson's disease. There's lots of links with it. And there's models. You know, I take vitamin B supplements. Um, but whether they would actually help, because we don't know that you're deficient in it, so that's the problem. We don't know that you're the problem. Uh, yeah. On the cells. On the cells, yeah. the muscle cells, and the input of oxygen. Mm -hmm. um, when there was fatigue and pain in the muscle, was there any long term effect on the muscle? Like, did over time the muscle become less likely to absorb more oxygen or any of those? Or did it remain the same? So there was no impact? Yeah, so. All we've done in this experiment, I'll just get it again. So, so these, are norm, these are normal muscles. So these are a muscle from me, say. These are a control muscle. So we've not tested patient's muscle. I know other people have. So other people have tested patient's muscles and shown there's a difference in the cells. So all we've done is we've taken normal muscle and we've added the blood from the patient. So we've taken the plasma from the patient. So we can't really say anything about the patient. We've looked a little bit. Um, so these people here, we've tried to look at, is there anything about their clinical profile that makes them different? And there really isn't anything that makes them stand out. So we're just, all we're saying is that there is something in the plasma of, say, this patient here that has a major influence on a normal muscle in a dish. So the question then is, what's that doing to that person's muscle? Um, we don't have that information. No, no. So, um, maybe I'll go to this chap. Yeah, so. Just a question on this oxygen consumption. Yep. In your previous slide, you mentioned about the low oxygen sats for people with the DME and CSS. And I was just thinking that uh, whether or not the hyperbaric treatment would, mm -hmm. would help people with that, with that problem? <laughs> Good question. So the question is, if ME patients are struggling with oxygen, because it's not high enough, if you put them in a high oxygen environment, like a hyperbaric chamber, would that improve function? And the guys in Poland are actually doing this. So the Polish group are testing, because again, in Poland, these hyperbaric chambers are really popular, um, but no one's done those tests yet. So it could help. Um, but we don't, we don't know the, da the data, but they're doing it now. Um, There's no studies with that on. No, no, not on MECFS. In other, in other diseases, that they, they use those chambers and they can be quite effective. Um, so it, it could be for some people, it might, might help, but let's see. But we, what we can do now is we can get all that information. So we, they'll do a hyperbaric. We'll run these experiments on the same samples. We'll do that, look at all the different chemicals in the blood on the same samples. So you can start to put the jigsaw together with the puzzle. Because if you just put all the patients in the hyperbaric chamber and three were, you wouldn't know why they work for those three and not the rest of them. So we need to try and put it all together, really. So, yeah. uh, who hasn't asked the question yet? Yeah, this lady here. So. Could you go back to the slide with the loaf of bread? Oh, yeah. Was that before? Yes. Yeah. So, could you just repeat what you said? So there is this paper here, and what they've found, 
that in a blood cell, which again may not be the right cell, that there is evidence that this bridge is not working properly. So on absorption of glucose? Not the, not the take-up, but more this bridge is here. So the bridge is here. So glucose starts as glucose and then it gets changed into various chemicals. And by the time it gets here, it's pyruvate. Yes. Right? But what they found is that the pyruvate carrying complex on the, on the level of RNA, so the expression, how much protein you've got, but not even, they didn't even measure the protein, they just measured the RNA, was, was half of what it should be. So they're hypothesizing that there could be a problem with that glucose getting in. You could try it, um, but it's not something I can really. There's no. So there's been no studies. No studies, no, no. Or have they? No, they, I think that has in MECFS, but they didn't really help. Um, but again, it's looking at everybody. I think there is a small. There are some. If anybody knows, I think there's, there is a small study on ketogenic diet. It works brilliant. So it works. A ketogenic diet in patients with a deficiency, kids with a pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency works really well in controlling their epilepsy because you bypass that thing. So, and I think there's, there's other, other things so as well. You did, you did say that there was a difference between CFS patients and, and control in terms of how well they coped with exercise on only genetic diet. Yeah, they just did better. So they didn't do any worse. So, so the, the difference was that the patients had the same outputs, right. whether, whether, whereas the controls We've done some other studies, but I haven't put them in because they're compli confusing. Whereas we find that the patients produce more CO2 than the controls, but it's a small cohort. But what that means is, is another question. Um, it's just these are two smaller studies to really put together, I think, at the moment. Um, ketogenic diet, we want to try ketones. We'd like to try ketone supplements. You can buy them in the US. Um, they sell beta hydroxybutyrate, it's called Delta G. You could buy some um, and get it online. I'm not advocating that you should, um, but you can. It's about 90 pounds for a day's course. So it's not something we could sustain, but it's something that as a drug, the, the health service, you know, what do they spend on immunotherapy, these chemotherapy drugs, spend hundreds of thousands of pounds. So as a patient, you, but they need to, we need to try it in a, in a really easy thing to do to test it. I know people that have taken those supplements and they say improved their symptoms. They weren't better, but their legs were better in terms of they felt like a walk better, their cognitive function, but that's one person. So, um, um, yeah. Um, they're sort of both together now, Newcastle University and Hospital. I've got a, uh, a cousin who's granddaughter. Yep. Um, has an extreme mitochondria. Right. She's 16, she's been in there in that Newcastle and Fairview Hospital. And the whole of the UK mm -hmm. deals with the very, very rare genetic disease. And that's why I've got, and they've just discovered the same thing in her 15 year olds. Oh, right, okay. So the diagnosis is they haven't got long to live. Right. Um, and I wanted to know, you know, that being as Newcastle is the only place in, in the UK mm -hmm. that could treat them, um, give them some quality of life, but they're losing mm -hmm. just limbs mm -hmm. in constant epileptic fits. Sure. So, so they're sort of interlinked now. So University of Newcastle would be the same. So Doug Turnbull runs the mitochondrial unit. So there's a big unit, but there, we have one in Oxford. So you'll get treatment for mitochondrial disease in, in, the, in the Children's Hospital in London, Great Ormond Street, in Oxford, all the centers, but there really isn't any good treatments. So that's the problem. They're both teenagers. Yeah. So they don't fall under. No. So there's a couple of drugs that work a bit, but there isn't really anything. The thing they're doing in Newcastle, they're trying to stop babies being born. So there's this triple parent idea where they, have, where they, they do that to try and prevent. Um, but in terms of the treatment, it's, it's not a very nice um, condition.
Oh, okay. Through channels in the mm -hmm. USA, yep. which has reduced the seizures from constant epileptic fits to mm -hmm. only two epileptic fits per week. Right. Yeah. Um, you should be able to get that in the UK now. You should, because I know. You're not. No. They just changed the rules. They just changed the rules on. Uh, yeah, yeah. You should get them to, because you can get farm. Because the problem about getting it from on the internet. You, the cannabis oil tends to come from hemp and things, and it may not be any good. Um, the private clinic, yeah, because you can, you can get it pharmaceutical grade. There are pharmaceutical grade cannabis that you can get in the UK from a company, and also there's some other companies that manufacture it from the plants. But it's, the laws have now changed because there was that case where that boy went to America to, and, and, and he came back with it and they wouldn't let him have it. And then he had multiple seizures, and so they've definitely changed the rules, particularly for that they should be able to get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm. Yeah. Um, maybe this lady here. Yeah. Yeah, I think for the, the chemical response, no one's really done the studies, but I know someone that works on Gulf War syndrome. So what he's doing, he's taking the same drugs that the soldiers got in the battlefields and trying those in animal models, and you get the same pathology. So for Gulf War, so the chemical exposure there, but general exposure in the environment, it's a tricky one. There's lots of anecdotal evidence, but there really isn't the hard data. People think about, you know, phone, radiation, deck phones, electromagnetic radiation, but I don't think no one's really... Doing it well, it's hard to do those studies, so how do you test the chemical on a person? You can't, you wouldn't get ethics to do that. All you, all you can do is look at, you know, thousands of people in the world and see whether there's any correlation. Um, I think they've probably tried to do that. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not been done. I think we, we need to, so it's, it's, this is what I'm saying about the subgrouping. Yeah. We need to look at the whole picture and try and, there may be subgroups of our patients that come out, because then we could look at, you know, to do, we're thinking of doing this um, cytokine, so there's these inflammatory markers. And we've got a, a collaborate in Italy, and, and they look at 25 of these markers. So that's, uh, that's going to cost about £600 per patient. So you have to build all these things into your project. So at the moment, antihistamines, um, it could be done, but I don't think anyone, we're not really there at that point of the budget. You know, look at the, the heart work research. They have hundreds of millions of pounds. We don't have that. So you, I suppose you've got to work out what you're going to spend it on initially. And then if it gets going, then I'm sure there will be people that come in that are interested in. There's a guy in America that's talking about mast cells at a meeting I went to. Um, but it's not in the mainstream. Um, but it could be important. Um, lady on the end. What's your opinion on the Indian behaviour therapy? For lack of any, uh, sadly, <laughs> the treatment. Because some patients are hesitant in going mm -hmm. that, you know, because of the stigma, you know, if yeah. you go to see a psychologist or psychiatrist, there's something something's wrong with that. Sure. And what, what's, you know, how does it help in the therapy, which many doctors are uh, trying to push? Mm -hmm. I know in the UK it's a, it's a, it's a tricky one because it's all been reviewed by the NICE guidelines. So we have a NICE guidelines commission that tells what therapy the doctors can use and that's currently in review because basically the patient groups and, and other people have now said that maybe this isn't working. But I know people that, that do it. Maybe you want, do you want to make a comment? Yeah. But it's yeah. just difficult to 
get the patient to go mm. because yes. of the, you know, the impact. Yeah. Yeah. This thing yeah. might have scratched away. That's just the, you know, the difficulty. Mm. But we don't know the chemical changes. Some of those might change with CBT, and unless you do the, the tests. Because other than the physios in Oxford, they, they really think what they do helps. But, but then you've got different groups of patients. You've got the ones coming through the clinic that, that are a mixed bag, and then you've got the ones that have had it for 20 years, and they're going to be different, aren't they, in terms of what might help one, might not help the other. So, so. I think part of the problem, too, is the fact that in the past, say in the 1980s, they... Uh, they are labeled as malingerers. Mm. And that has been carried forward. Sure. And you know, that, that just makes a lot of, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, block for patients to go forward. Yeah. For even just psychotherapy, you know, maybe one or two sessions. Because <coughs> mm. we don't know how the brain affects us, do we? You know, you've probably got no conscious control of it. Um, Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yes. And there's also finding now that uh, there's brain inflammation going on. Mm. So maybe related to the gut. Yeah, but I know the guys in America that, 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 that you yeah. know, but it needs a bigger, bigger thing. Yeah. Okay, uh, one on the end? Oh, sorry, the guy with the beard there. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm um, just telling about three or four things that sort of come out of this, and I'm just wondering what I would kind of put on onto, you were talking about, um, first of all, you said that, that um, in terms of fighting viruses, that sort of a suboptimal energy producing mitochondria work better than the sort of high power one. <laughs> yep. and, and secondly, you, you talked about um, the pyruvate not being able to get in and feed the mitochondria. So if one way to make a, you know, that, that if you, if you make, you can make a good mitochondria look mm -hmm. like a sort of suboptimal one by just choking off the energy coming in. Yep. And then you talk about this metabolic switch. Um, so is this, is this idea of the metabolic switch that the gene that controls the, whatever it is, the pyruvate change that allows it to get into the mm -hmm. mitochondria, so you've got a gene controlling an enzyme, producing an enzyme that makes that happen, Sure. If gene gets turned off and it doesn't get in, does so that what, what, what the metabolic switch is all about? It's about making <coughs> that gene gets turned off so that we choke off the energy supply so that sure. the mitochondria work suboptimally and it helps us, it gives us a better chance against the viral infection. Yeah, so the study with the metabolic switch yeah. was at the, at the gene level, so that was the gene effect. So you're right, there, there could be a change there. Um, the way that the viral thing seems to work, it's more around the, the DNA that the mitochondria make. So you could nob nobble somebody's mitochondria and it wouldn't necessarily make them better dealing with infection, with the virus. What you have to do to the mitochondria is to change their structure. And what they then do is they, essentially the mitochondria, when you get infected with the virus, chuck out DNA into the cell, and then that DNA activates pathways. Um, so just by infecting their energy wouldn't necessarily do that. It seems to be that process of throwing out the Does DNA. The virus get into the mitochondria? No, but we think it's the, it's the cell DNA. So No, so it's quite an interesting paper this guy Philip West wrote, that the mitochondrial DNA gets out of the of the mitochondria, and then is involved in that cell's response to the virus. So we used to think that the, say, the herpes virus or whatever would be the thing that triggered these pathways, but it now looks like the mitochondrial DNA can also trigger these pathways. Um, so that's only in the last couple of years um, that that goes on. So there could be a problem in some cells um, that they don't get rid of infection very well, but in other cells it may make no difference. This is me speculating a bit about the, 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 the viral effects. But the bridge, this bridge here, there was a gen genetic change in the white cells that could, but then how does that equate to the, the, other, the bigger tissues? You know, was that change in the brain as well? Or was it just in the, in the blood cell? Until we can do that, until we can work on the right tissues, it's really hard to know 
what some of this blood work means. So the plasma, if you like, is sampling everything in the patient, everything. Uh, and what we try and avoid is the blood having an impact, because I know if I leave that blood for too long, I'm looking at the blood and not the patient, and that's what we need to be careful of. Um, who hasn't asked a question? You've asked a question. Any new questioners down the end there? Um, Mm-hmm. And you look at uh, Jen Breyer, who was in the unrest movie you mentioned, recently she's got a whole new diagnosis for a neurological condition, yeah. which probably is only so fantastic. Um, has there been any studies which have taken people who supposedly had CFS, but then they really interrogated, looked hard for a differential diagnosis, yeah. and measured some sort of rate of people who have diagnosed mm-hmm. CFS? So the study that's doing that is the one in the NIH. So they're taking small numbers. 30 patients, and they look. They study them for weeks, and I think you're right. That's what they're thinking: is that there are things in there that are different that they can diagnose from those people, and then if they can diagnose them, then you may be able to do something about them. So there's there's comorbidities in there, um, but then we don't know what CFS is, do we? We know what the final symptoms are, but we don't know what drives it. So. Yep. Really yeah. Really well, that's right. Really sure. But, but you need a good test that you can use. That, that, that yeah. NIH study, you know, some, bringing somebody to hospital for six weeks over years costs millions. So is, is there an, an easier way to get that information without bringing them in? So hopefully we're going to test their samples. So we'll test their samples and then hopefully we'll be able to in, maybe interrogate, you know, from their clinical data, what profile fits with this and that. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we've finished there. Um, but please join me in thanking Carl for an excellent uh, presentation. <laughs>